Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to the Melbourne PC User Group monthly meeting for August 2nd, 2023. Um, you all know me, I'm, I'm Hugh MacDonald, I'll be your MC for this evening. Um, so um, how's everyone going tonight? All good. And uh, is anyone here for the first time this evening? <coughs> first time post-COVID, well, welcome back after a few years then. Uh, anyone out there on Zoom tonight um, joining us for the first time? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <clears throat> so uh, just to, to remind you that uh, this meeting is being recorded at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> oh, there's two. Okay, well, hello to them. Welcome to the, the meeting. Um, so yeah, so the meeting is being recorded. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, please make sure you keep your microphone muted if you're not speaking. And uh, please, and uh, the meeting is going to be uploaded to YouTube. So um, there will be a permanent record of this on the internet after the meeting. So um, I'll start by introducing our, our first keynote speaker tonight. Her name is uh, Kath. Walters, and uh, her topic is seven ways to use ChatGPT to help you write your book. So Kathy is a, a book coach, the founder of the program Brain to Book in 90 Days, and a professional business writer and author of 25 years plus. Kath knows what business readers want and expect, and she's been giving them what they want and expect for more than two decades. As a professional business writer, Kath has written something like 1.6 million words over the past 25 years including three books. As a business journalist, Cass' writing reached 40,000 readers a week for 14 years. Her byline is familiar to, to readers of the Australian Financial Review, Smart Company, BRW, Business Spectator, Women's Agenda, ANZ Blue Notes, and Company Director. Now, Cass guides smart, accomplished business people through a momentous transition. They are experienced, thoughtful practitioners, coaches, trainers, and speakers. They have an idea for a book that is like a mental itch that must be scratched. Getting that idea out of their heads and into a book takes them to the next level in their business. They become sought after authorities with the book to prove it. To date, over 50 authors have written and published a book using Kath's Brain to Book in 90 Days program. So welcome Kath, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you for the lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. <coughs> now. Are these, these are on, are they, or are, I'm not worrying about the microphones? <clears throat> I'm, I'm happy as long as everyone can hear. Do you want to... I've got, I've got a bit of a croaky kind of a voice, naturally. So, um, yeah, so if, you, if you're struggling to hear, please do feel free to move closer. So, um, somewhere, you know, somehow, the fable of the, the, um, the hare and the tortoise, uh, became sort of inextricably linked in my mind with the Disney cartoon. And uh, in my mind's eye, I see the hare and the tortoise at the, at the start when the start gun goes off and uh, the hare is kind of careening all over the place and the tortoise is kind of plodding along and uh, with really exaggerated marching steps. And I, I can kind of almost hear the music too, you know, the tuba sort of playing for the, the tortoise and the, some sort of crazy jazz uh, playing for the, for, the, um, for, the, for the hare. And the moral of the, stool, of the fable is that slow and steady wins the race. You know, the rabbit runs out of puff <clears throat> and the tortoise keeps plodding and it reaches the finish line first. But the problem for us here today is that the tortoise is wrong. So slow and steady won't win the race with AI. You might feel like me, like a rabbit sort of careening around all over the place, running um, out of puff on the journey to understanding AI, but we've got to get our inner rabbit on and <laughs> we really have to channel our inner rabbit and get moving on AI fast. So hello and, and welcome to today's talk on the power of artificial intelligence to revolutionise the way you write your book. 
Um, my name is Kath Walters and I've been uh, beautifully introduced, so uh, I will just say that I'm really thrilled to be talking to you today about this game-changing tool. And I see it as having really three fantastic purposes for us as authors. The first is to streamline your writing process, to help you do everything faster. The second is to enhance your creativity. And the third is to sort of deepen and, and solidify your intellectual property. So the topic of our discussion today is seven ways to use ChatGTP chat GTP, to write your book. And we're going to start the rabbit journey to discover the incredible potential of AI in authoring your next bestseller. And we're also going to ex um, explore potential pitfalls. Because, you know, what could possibly go wrong? In this talk, um, I, I will sort of talk about prompts. I will actually give you some prompts that you can experiment with, with at home. So if you want to grab your notebooks or um, turn on your phone recorders, that's absolutely fine to get down these, um, these prompt ideas. <coughs> um, so I've created this talk and the accompanying slides with the help of ChatGPT. And throughout this 20-minute session, I'm going to show you the types of results to expect and exactly how I've used AI to create authority building content. So firstly, how many of you have tried AI, whether ChatGPT or any other type? Great, fantastic. Um, how many tried it yesterday? <laughs> Excellent. Great, okay. So I have spent the last six months really deeply immersed in this technology working with other people who are also immersed in it and attending as many forums as I can to develop a position on AI. Because of course, you know, the moment it came out and you could just put in there, you know, give me a book outline, <laughs> I thought to myself, I better make sure that I'm not going to be out of business next week. So uh, that was why I decided to get immersed and, and I had to play with it. And uh, there are a lot of ha rabbits who are way ahead of me, which is super helpful. So I've been drawing on their, their knowledge. So we all kind of know what it can do. And even if you haven't actually used it, you will have seen stories about AI-generated articles appearing in magazines, AI-generated photos winning competitions. Did you, did you hear about that one? The, the, um, yeah, the photograph that won the competition. I mean, it was, a, it was a beautiful, did you look at the photo? I, I mean, it, it was a supreme use of AI. Um, and, you know, if you watched Four Corners recently, you will have even seen AI romances. Yeah, a guy having a relationship with a, an AI chatbot. <laughs> so how do we respond to this? So, uh, sorry, I'll just flick through that a little bit. So the first point I want to make is that we join the, the robot revolution. Yeah. So we get on board with the robot revolution and you commit to, to using AI to write your next book or, or whatever it is that you want to write. Because let's face it, who needs human creativity when you've got a computer that can churn out pages faster than you can say, I have writer's block. No, seriously, uh, I really think we need human <laughs> creativity. In a world where technology is constantly advancing, we really have to stay ahead of the curve um, and embrace the benefits that, that AI has to offer. So at the World Economic Forum um, annual meeting in 2022, economist and professor Richard Baldwin offered the following in insight. AI will not take your job somebody using AI will take your job, yep. And this quote highlights the importance of adapting to and really embracing the potential of new technologies. So rather than fearing the innovations themselves, the publishing revolution, the self-publishing revolution, nothing to do with AI, that's already in full swing. Uh, with more and more authors choosing to bypass even traditional publishers, and bring their work directly to readers. And the advent of AI writing assistance is another revolution in content creation. 
you will probably have heard that chat GPT had a million re users within five days of launching uh, in November 2022 and that it set a growth record of a, a, by achieving 100 million users in two months by January 2023. Um, I did look up today to see if there are any more uh, up-to-date figures on that, but they, they were still the ones that I saw widely quoted. Has anybody seen uh, more up-to-date figures on, on the number of users? I, I haven't, but um, yeah. And, but I did see that by July, when I, I last made this presentation, it had 1.6 billion page views. It's now at 9 billion. So that was in May. And you know, in those last few months, we've gone from 1.6 billion to 9 billion. So as authors, we can harness the capabilities of AI tools to enhance our work and stay competitive in our respective fields. And by integrating uh, AI into your writing processes, you unlock new presentation uh, possibilities sorry, and expand your horizons, creating content that deeply resonates with audiences. So I wanted to give my, the first tip. Oh, oh, so my first question to you, really, I'm going to ask you seven questions in this presentation. The first one is, are you ready to join the robot revolution? and make the best possible use of AI. Who's there? Who's with me on this? Well, no, we've got some doubters yet. Yeah, let's see how we go by the end. <laughs> hey, convince you? Okay, I'm gonna work my hardest. What's your name, sorry? What, what was your name? Peter. Peter, I'm gonna work my hardest for you. Okay, so my very first tip for you today is that it's worth using ChatGPT4 for longer chats and more sophisticated results. So who here has invested the 20 US dollars uh, American a month, no, Noah? On and off, yeah, turning on and off, yeah. So um, the, the key differences that have been explained to me, apart from having to pay 20 US dollars a month, is that um, there's a kind of, um, there's a name for it, but there's a, it's capable of remembering 50,000 words, uh, the chat GPT-4. So in, in a conversation, it can go backwards 53, uh, 50,000 versus uh, three and a half thousand in, in chat 3.5. Uh, 3 so the, the significance of that is that if you continue to chat with the bot over a long period of time, um, it starts to forget what it said earlier on. Um, and so it's quite a, you know, you can make quite a big difference. They've also just increased to doubled the amount of uh, prompts you can do on four. So they had restricted it to 25 every three hours. Um, and now they've given you 50, which is quite hard to use in, in three hours, especially if you use long prompts. So um, it's worth actually getting out there and having a play with both versions because you can see quite different levels of response. Sometimes you get something more suitable for your task in 3.5, but generally, genuine generally uh, for what is is more um, uh, sophisticated so the second thing we're going to talk about today is to toddler proof your AI so you would not trust your toddler with a bottle of whiskey so I don't <laughs> suggest that you trust your AI without proper governance so you want to establish rules and regulations for your robot writing buddy uh, or you risk ending up with a book that doesn't really make sense or reflect your professionalism or your intellectual property. And by governance, I mean predetermining what you will let your AI assistant do uh, for you and what you will prohibit it from doing. And the other is, um, sorry, the second part of that is not in there. The second governance is deciding how you want to use its guidance. So for example, I will not let AI write entire paragraphs or determine the ideas that I want to include in my book, uh, in my writing, I mean. Uh, I have asked it to um, draft an outline for a book called How to Write a Brilliant Book um, in 90 Days, and it does not come up with my book. So uh, I bring my ideas to the table and then I ask it to help me with those ideas. Um, I did ask ChatGPT for, for, for help with this particular presentation, uh, seven ways to use ChatGPT. 
GPT. It did not come up with the points that I'm uh, giving you now. However, I will let it guide my expression. So for example, I had called this establish AI governance, <laughs> but I let ChatGP create what I think is a better um, headline, toddler proof your AI. So, um, uh, and yeah, I, I, some of the other words in this presentation are, have come by ChatGPT. So the three governance principles the way we're going to use um, uh, AI is we're going to use it intelligently, creatively and ethically. So uh, those are the three governance principles that I apply to AI and I ask my own clients who are writing books to apply. So you will need specific strategies to deliver on those principles and we're going to explore those strategies. So my next question for you is, have you thought through and established proper AI governance for every writing um, task and person in your business? That is if you're, so who really has a business? Okay, not for your business, but for yourself, have you thought through the tasks that you're doing? Do you know what you're gonna let it do and what you're gonna say, no, nah, I'm not doing? So let's have a little bit of a look at some strategies that can help you establish those governance ideas. So the first one is to give your ro robot context. So context is key for all writing, especially for robots. And here we're gonna get down to the business of creating some prompts to use with ChatGPT. So the context point is one of the practical strategies that I mentioned a, a moment ago. And I'm going to give you three strategies to create context. The first one is that you need your prompts to be customised. Let's have a look at that. Who you are, who you are talking or writing for, and what outcome they can achieve by working with you. So, for example, if you are... Can somebody give me a role that they do? Can somebody give me some work that they do? Cook, okay. So I am a, um, a cook um, who helps uh, young people, let's say. I, I'm a qualified cook, cooking instructor who helps young people to create um, uh, every night, you know, weekday dinners in under 20 minutes. Or in my case, I am a non-fiction book coach who helps professional coaches, trainers and speakers to write a brilliant business book in 90 days. So the prompt that you use to, to customise it is, I am a, nature of your expertise, who helps target reader to achieve outcome. So you might need to work a bit on that prompt, but this helps the, um, to customise the responses that you get from ChatGPT. Is everyone following me here? Yep, we're all, we're all kind of on board? Okay, great. So, um, it's one of the most important prompts. It's, it's really, I, I think of it more as priming the, the chatbot to be who you want it to be. Um, and it should be in front of almost everything that you ask. So, some sort of priming statement it should be the first thing that you give the, the robot so that it knows who you are, it, it, you know, who it's talking to so and what it's talking about and, and who it has to keep in mind. So the second part, uh, the second strategy to get great results out of ChatGPT is to be concrete. So you've got to tell it what you want. So. For example, write a list of 30 problems that professional coaches, trainers and speakers face when trying to write a brilliant book. So that is a specific request that will deliver clear results. You know, it's a guardrail for your robot to make sure that it is helpful. So firstly, we're going to customise it. Secondly, we're going to be concrete about what it is that you want. Um, and finally, you're going to be comprehensive. 
So how do you want your answer to be? So for example, I might say, I'm a, I'm a, um, a non-fiction book coach, so this is all one prompt. I'm a non-fiction book coach who helps professional coaches, trainers and speakers to write a brilliant book in 90 days. I want you to write a list of 30 problems that my, my market face when they're trying to write a brilliant business book. And then I'm going to be really clear about how. When listing the problems, the 30 problems, include both real and imagined problems. So include the problems that my, my market are, are real, the real problems they face, and the imagined problems they face. Two, rank the problems in the order, um, in the order that this target group might perceive to be the most challenging. So you can get it to be even more specific. Rank the problems. And then I ask it to use emotive language. So I ran this prompt, and th this is available. You can come, uh, of course, because it's 30, <laughs> it's very small. So I didn't attempt to put it on a slide. But I did give, um, provide you with some of the results here. So we can see that it says, uh, you know, certainly, it's very, uh, very polite. Here are 30 problems that professional coaches, trainers and speakers face when trying to write a book, ranked by a perceived challenge. Overwhelming fear of failure, a paralyzing terror. <laughs> they, they will create something unworthy of their reputation, leaving, leading to self-doubt and procrastination. That is bang on. Right? That is typically what my clients are, are, are dealing with, although they would not say it quite like that. But you remember that I did ask my chatbot to use emotive language. Debilitating writer's block. A massive, impassable wall. Standing between them and their creative potential. Making it feel impossible to begin or continue. Lack of time, the relentless suffocating pressure of existing commitments that crushes the space needed for creativity and thoughtful reflection. Inexperience with the writing pro process, the terrifying unknown journey of transforming thoughts into coherent prose, a confusing maze with no clear path and an inability to find a unique voice a stifling constraint that smothers their individuality, forcing them to struggle to express their true selves. So, what do you reckon? I've got to ask you, what do you think about a, a, a ranking out of, say, 10? What do, you, what do you give it? Who's here? Who here is under five? Who thinks it's between five and seven? Who thinks it's at seven to 10? It's not bad, is it? You know, like if you really give it this degree of clarity, it's concrete, um, it is um, comprehensive, and it is um, customized to you, you start to get some really great uh, responses out of this, um, of the robot. So, um, these you can see, uh, so you, you can look at this um, recording uh, later and, and get, it, get these prompts. So here's a tip. Um, you, can, you still must, for some reason in ChatGPT, you still must copy and paste the answers you get to each prompt immediately into a Google or Word document. So look, it's not refreshing without warning. It hasn't done that to me for a long time now. But it did, in the early days, refresh without warning, and my work was lost. So uh, I think it's more stable now, but I, I, it was a bit unstable, so I suggest that you do copy and paste your work out of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other one that I, other hot tip I have is, I'm a fan of the long prompt, as you might see. So with this, this level of detail, I find that it's very used to use something like Text Expander. There's an equivalent in, in the Android world, I believe. I think Text Expander might be Mac. So that um, you can create shortcuts for your, for your context statements, sorry, um, context statements. So does anybody here use an, an expander of some sort? Yes? 
Okay. So your expanders, you can put in a long sentence. It's like on your phone, the shortcuts. So you put in a few letters or numbers. And when you put those letters and numbers and type them into ChatGPT, it will expand with the full context. So my context um, prompt, I only have to write CCXT and it comes out with that full prompt. I am a non-fiction book coach whose market is a little, 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 little helps them do, yep, the whole thing. So that can be, that can be fun. So my third question for you is, have you determined all of the context you will need for your AI's writing, including how you describe yourself, your target market, and the outcome you deliver? Um, so I'm just wondering how I'm going. I'm, I think I'm going a little long at the moment. It's okay. Just, just boo me off if you get bored, okay? Um, so my fourth point here is ideas before prompts. So what ChatGPT can do, as a language model, ChatGPT can um, predict the next most likely word in a sentence. Um, and that's how it works. It draws on millions of words in the database and it says the mo next most likely um, uh, word is uh, whatever it is. And ChatGPT can write with absolute certainty and conviction even on ridiculous topics and even when it's wrong. It's getting more narrow now. I was having a chat with, uh, it's Pete, oh, sorry, was it? Um, oh, gee, I'm having trouble reading that distance. David, um, with David before, and uh, you know, we were talking about how we'd actually receive prompts with um, you know, chapter and verse, you know, that a link out, uh, a, a, an author, a title of a, an article, a summary of it, are all completely bogus. Yep, so you've got, you've got to do your desk research and check it. So you don't let AI determine the, the direction of your book. You develop your ideas first, and then you use prompts as a supplement. So this is probably one of the most important things I can say to you today. Um, the robots are so sure of themselves, and authors are typically very unsure of ourselves, yeah? So they give really confident answers to all questions, even when they have limited knowledge. They quote sources that don't exist and they don't know the difference between fact and fiction. So what they can't do is tell the difference between fact and fiction, although they are improving, I think, and they can't be original, although they can be pretty awesome. <laughs> so I, here's a prompt um, here um, that you could use. I'm going to read it out so that it's on the, uh, on the um, recording. So this is your your content your um, customization prompt. If I am a book coach who helps professional um, coaches, trainers, and speakers to write a brilliant book in 90 days, what is a succinct expression of my value pro um, proposition from the edited list I've pasted below? And then you paste in your value proposition. Mine is write a brilliant book in 90 days. Provide two versions, one no more than 25 words. So there's an example of a prompt where you can really get this, this uh, robot helping you to think about how to express your ideas better. You know your value proposition, you know what it is that you do uh, and how you help people. So does everybody kind of, does everybody uh, know what a value proposition is? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's just an expression of what value you bring. So I help um, professional coaches, authors and speakers write a brilliant book in 90 days. That's my value proposition. If you can come up with a better one than that, oh, I dare it. But, <laughs> but maybe you can. And when I put in this, uh, I've got really interesting results. And um, so uh, I, the, the answer it gave for me, I'm not sure if I actually wrote it down here, but I, it said... Oh yes, no, I put in the fourth, yeah. So what you can do is have a play with that prompt and see what it is that you, that you, you get back. And this is an example of using your um, robot to really refine your ideas. So my question um, number four is, do you prioritise ideas over prompts when working with AI? So prioritising your ideas over 
over the uh, the robot. Um, so number five is to get cheeky, baby. <laughs> so your robot is a bit of a shapeshifter, right? It can be you in all your different moods. You can be funny, serious, journalistic, weird, modern, youthful, funky, breathless, excited. You know, so spice things up a bit and be a bit cheeky with your, your prompts, yeah? Um, let your robot have a little bit of fun with your writing and see where this takes you. So let's apply this to your value proposition response uh, re results. So, you know, if you put in your, uh, that, that prompt before about your value proposition, you now say, rewrite the value proposition in a spicy and breathless um, uh, tone way. And um, yeah, you just get it to refer to the previous thing and get, see what it comes back with if you ask it to write in a different way. Uh, you can ask it to write, you know, you, you, I think you've probably heard people talk about getting it to write like Malcolm Gladwell or getting it to write like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Um, 50, 50 Cent, you know, 50 Cent's the, the rapper. So, you know, you can get a lot of different responses and it's, it's really super fun to have a bit of a, you know, and this might be great. Um, sort of inspiration if you're thinking of, of doing creative writing um, to use it in this way. There's the, there's the prompt. So are you willing to get cheeky with your AI's writing style? I should have been getting a show of hands. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got a few on cheekiness at least. The, the sixth point is to question robot wisdom. So don't blindly trust the answers your AI gives you, yeah? analyze them question them and you, or you might end up with your ip making as much sense as a square circle so this is the fourth element of your ai governance yeah so we had the three ideas of, cust of customization concrete and uh, comprehensive and this is the fourth one the thing that goes around the whole sort of idea is to uh, um, critique it yeah so when you get back the answers from your robot, apply your critical faculties and assess the answers. Your first response is probably going to be, wow. Like, mine is often wow. But you need to ask yourself lots of questions. Um, and the most important of these questions, oh, sorry, I've just got it, is, um, sorry, it's not on there. Do these answers align with your experience as an expert in your field, as a subject matter expert? So whatever the robot comes back with, does it actually match what you know to be true? That to me is the most important uh, question. So do you, my question number six is, do you know your reader well enough? and use that knowledge to analyze and question your AI's answers. So it's okay to say no to that question because it really does take a bit of thinking and possibly those prompts that I suggested before to get a deep insight into your reader before you actually, you know, to, to, before you write anything. Those prompts will give you an insight into your reader, It'll give you an insight into their, their problems. So here we are at question number seven, at point number seven. So knowing what writing matters. So, um, you, know, you, you've been, um, you, you've been. So, um, some kinds of writing matter a lot to a brand and, and your reputation, and some just don't matter so much. So for some writing, maybe your book, for example, you have to really be the master of AI. You have to be absolutely its master. For other writing, maybe getting it to do a landing page to sell your book, you know, once you've written it, hey, why not let AI do the work, you know? Like, it's just not as important. I recently um, devised a job description for, um, for a virtual assistant and I then asked ChatGPT to write, so I devised the, the job description. Then I said to ChatGPT, write the job ad. It was fantastic. 
Then I asked it to write the interview process. <laughs> it was great. And all the interview questions, yeah? And then I asked it to suggest places for me to advertise the job in, in the Philippines. And, you know, it was, it was terrific. It actually came up with places that really did exist in this, in this case. Although it did tell me I'm a language model, so I might not be right, but it was right. <laughs> so I did the thinking first about the, about the CV, about the, the actual criteria, about who I wanted and what they do in my business. But my robot really did the rest of that really hard work, yeah? Um, so this is a, a final prompt. Um, so you would put your customised prompt. Your, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a book coach who, uh, a non-fiction book coach, etc. I've written a book that solves the 30 problems above, right? The 30 problems that you wrote before. Um, write me a landing page page that will provide a compelling case for would-be authors to sign up to buy my book as soon as it's written. <laughs> Include the book title and sub subtitle. Sell the book but use a friendly tone, avoid hyperbole. So now I'm, I'm telling it to, that I've written a book that solves the problems that it identified. Now write a landing page that's going to sell that book to my market. Incredibly um, fun to do. So I've got one last tip for you today um, from the amazing Dan Hill, who's a sort of a thought leader in, um, in various ways. Does anybody know Dan Hill? Really worth following. Um, he says, you know, let your AI be your personal assistant. So you can use a prompt like this. I've been working hard all week. Write me a menu for a simple nutritional um, uh, entree and main meal I can cook in one to one hour. <laughs> Provide me with the recipes. Write out the shopping list. <laughs> Why not get it to do that, yeah? We don't have to get it to do all the serious things. So do you know which tasks matter? to your brand. So that's it from me. Any questions? Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, question after? Okay, no problem. Yeah, so yeah, I thought we'd have um have Barry first and then questions both of you after that. So if you have questions, um, please hold on to them. For a few more minutes. Um, that's right. So now um, I'd like to welcome our very own club member Barry Horn uh, up here to uh, talk about how I unintentionally became a poet, author, and publisher. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. So now for something completely different. How did I become a poet? quite by accident. Uh, I, for quite a number of years, have been producing that monthly church magazine for our church. And uh, when COVID hit us in early 2020, and times were feeling pretty scary, actually, because we didn't know what COVID was going to do to us. We saw reports overseas that were quite scary, and uh, we hoped we could keep it out of the country, but without any certainty. So it was a fairly dour time. And I wanted to lighten the mood a little bit in my church magazine. So initially I found some nice COVID-related cartoons on the internet. And there's, there were some quite good ones. So I'd put one of those in the magazine. But then after a time, it seemed to me that the cartoonists seemed to run out of inspiration and I thought what else could I do but uh, I was noticing that uh, when people were starting to wear masks every now and again you couldn't rec didn't recognize somebody that you thought you ought to have been able to recognize I thought and you have to ask and then I thought hold on ask rhymes with mask and and a little and a little poem started to uh, uh, form itself in my in my head so I thought so I, I developed it and I put it in the in the magazine and it goes who's that I ask behind the mask come knocking at my door you ring a bell but I can't tell have I met you before 
just let me pass you silly ass. you've known me all my life. Oh goodness me, now I can see you are my darling wife. <laughs> and it goes downhill from there. So that got a good reception from everybody apart from my darling wife. So I thought next month I'll try something else. And I only came up with a little short one related to, uh, well, social distancing, but we learnt to call it physical distancing, didn't we? Didn't want to be socially distanced. So stay a metre and a half apart. That's what the Premier said. Leslie said we should try that at home and shove me out of the bed. So that got a good reception and then people said to me, will we get one next month? So I had to work on it and of course we're into, uh, into lockdowns and some people didn't mind being locked down because it was a chance to escape from the rat race for a short time and uh, catch up on things that you've been putting off, fixing around the home. But I wasn't one of those pe people, I like to be out and about. And I said to my wife, I'm bored with this life at home with nothing to do. Since April or May, I've wasted each day and I'm starting to feel a bit blue. She said back to me, oh yes, I can see you really are short of a clue. If I give it some thought, I think that I ought come up with an answer for you. You can make up the bed and clean out the shed. There's washing to go on the line, vacuum the floors, wipe down the doors. The windows could do with the shine. Well, she was very kind to have me in mind. And considering all that she said, I thought it was best to have a good rest and got back into my bed. I, uh, then as time goes on, you sort of relate to things that are happening. And um, like our club here, we, like, like we're doing it tonight, we communicate with people on Zoom so we don't have to be in the one place at the one time. And I wrote a poem about Zoom, which uh, uh, Hugh put in the uh, PC update one day last, last year. Zooming works very well, excepting the first time you've tried it, you've probably got tangled up like I did and made a bit of a mess of it. And they're calling a meeting and said I should go. But I'm stuck at home, there's a virus you know. They said not to worry, we're going to Zoom. It will all be online, you can stay in your room. Well, it was all new to me and I'm sad to relate, I mucked up the passcode and joined them all late. And then I could see them and they couldn't see me. I had no idea where that button should be. And it was just bad luck that my phone chose to ring. It gave me a fright and I dropped the damn thing. And I felt like a coot when the sound went all mute and they tried to explain, but it didn't compute. By then I had something important to say, but the time had run out and they'd all gone away. I promised that next time I'd have it all righted. They said not to bother, I'd not be invited. <laughs> But some good things happened because uh, lockdowns, excuse me a minute, lockdowns and travel bans and things come to an end and uh, I remember the, uh, we had a travel ban where you weren't allowed to go anywhere and then it was five kilometres and then 25 kilometres which still keeps you in Melbourne and then it was finally relaxed. And with thanks to Dan, the travel ban to Melbourne is no more. There is no bar on going far as once there was before. But where to go? I do not know. I really do not care. Just to be free is enough for me. It doesn't matter where. So fancy free, but aimlessly, we headed out the gate and to our cost, got very lost, arrived home very late. So lessons learned and fingers burned. We thought from now we may Try not to roam too far from home and stick with 25k. <laughs> you may remember as we approached Christmas in 2020, long time ago now, 
and uh, we, all the, the states were locking their borders. And as Christmas approached, uh, they're all going to be opened up, except Western Australia was keeping uh, locked down. But, if you, but there was a 14-day quarantine if you were coming from overseas. And uh, that bothered me a little bit. Christmas is approaching and I heard the PM say, the borders soon will open up, apart from WA. But if you come from overseas, it stays as it has been. You'll need to spend some 14 days in hotel quarantine. Now, based on my arithmetic, I'm sorry to relate, I don't think we'll see Santa until January 8. <laughs> One of the uh, tragedies of lockdowns was that Bunnings had to close their sausage sizzles. And uh, I actually am part of a team that does sausage sizzles at Bunnings every now and again. And it's quite clear that some people come to Bunnings for a sausage first and then decide they'll do some shopping while they're there. But it was great when, when they, uh, the sausage sizzles were back. The cupboard is broken, I've told you before, the hinges are loose and I can't close the door. So I went off to Bunnings to buy some new screws where a long absent odour brought very good news. Sausages sizzling. It's been a long time. So I got out my money and stood in the line and bought myself two, with onion of course, smothering both with mustard and sauce. Then I raced quickly home to share the good news just to be greeted with where are the screws? <laughs> I was trying to keep a, a, month, a, a poem going for every month, but uh, sometimes when you're doing that, you run out of inspiration. I didn't think of asking chat GPT for an idea. So I just had to write no poem today, I'm sorry to say. I hope you don't mind very much. I haven't retired. I'm just not inspired. I think I'm losing my touch. It takes a long time to pen a good rhyme, as most of you already know. So I think it is best to have a good rest while the words are refusing to flow. But after this break that I have to take, while nothing is going to plan, I'll try once again to turn on my brain and return with a rhyme when I can. And I finished writing these poems <clears throat> uh, just a year ago now on the 12th of July, 2022, because that's when the state of emergency in Victoria ended and uh, the legislation under which Dan was uh, doing lockdowns and restric restrictions uh, was coming to an end. So I, I thought, that's enough. <laughs> and uh, so the, my finale was, the Premier said it's in his head that from July the 12th, the, his COVID rules are not the tools to guarantee our health. So from that date, I'm pleased to state that just as was intended, Lockdowns, masks and check-in tasks will thankfully have ended. The virus will be with us still. It's not just academic, but protection from injection will control the ec epidemic. So life can be a lot more free, just as in former times. And by request, I'll take a rest from writing silly rhymes. So if, if you call that poetry, and that's how I inadvertently became a poet. I thought that was the end of it, excepting uh, one of the men at the church, the treasurer actually, said to me, when you compile the anthology, I want the first signed copy. So I said to him, it's got nothing to do with theology. He said, look up the dictionary. So I looked up anthology, <laughs> which is a collection of poems. So he was asking me to, to put them in a book. 
And I thought, oh, yeah. And then, but a few other people sit quite separately said, you're going to put them in a book, aren't you? So, oh. So I thought there was, sounded like there was enough interest and perhaps I should think of doing that. So I had a look. I had 40, 40 poems. And uh, then I thought if I put the, if I just a whole lot of words in the book's a bit boring. So my, my, my younger brother, who lives in Cairns as an artist, so I prevailed upon him to do some sketches to put through, to put, put through the book and illustrate it because it visually makes it a lot more, a lot more interesting. I had a bit of trouble with him because he's got a great sense of humour also and was starting to put his own spin on the various topics. And I had to say, no, 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 no. You're supposed to be illustrating my poems. If you want to do a book, you can do it. Um, so anyway, um, so I had some illustrations, um, quite a lot. He, he does them quite fast to select from and scatter through the, the book, which I did. Um, then you've got to think about uh, uh, what, what size is the book, what, you know. And I always start off by thinking of A four because it's everyone's got a four paper and and this is a five so when you're printing on both sides of the paper you get four four pages from one sheet of a four and with 40 poems and some sketches and an introduction you know it's not too fat and it's not too thin so a five seemed to be about right then you've got to deal with how you're going to bind it well saddle stitching with a couple of staples through there is the is the way to do that and you need a cover so okay. played around a bit with some colors that sort of blue with a transition in it that doesn't look too bad and um, played around with fonts so that Arial seems to be easy to read and tried to make it so that no uh, there's only one or two poems that went over a page because they had to and uh, fit them all on a page and scatter the illustrations through where they, aimlessly where they fit, and wrote a, a, a page of introduction uh, to put it in context. And then you need a, um, a title. And I called it Poems for a Pandemic because I thought that uh, if there's another pandemic one day, I won't have to bother writing poems. We can use these ones again. So they're poems for a pandemic. So I, um, no, I went and spoke to my friends at Quick Copy in Burwood because they do the church magazine and he's done various other publications for me or people that I've recommended. So he said, yeah, that's fine. Here's what material we can use for the cover and all the rest of it and how much will it cost. So he said $4.70 or something. Four dollars something, I can't remember, per each. So I thought that's okay if we sell them to... I didn't envisage anyone apart from church people being interested. And uh, five, five bucks and I didn't want to make any money out of it. Then someone said to me, look, if you end up with any change, can you put it into the Tonga project? Now, we happen to know a few people um, from Tonga, from a, a particular village, which is called uh, Kano Kapolo, which you'll all remember, which uh, you remember in January of 2022, there was an undersea volcano near Tonga and it flooded the, the, the place with uh, uh, volcanic ash and then a tsunami wiped some of the villages off the face of the earth, which included this particular one. And whilst the government and some larger funds uh, will help rebuild houses, everybody's lost all their contents, contents, all their animals, all their crops, all their clothes. So um, an appeal was started to try and help them recover. So I was pretty happy to say yes to that. And then, so I said to the, my friend at Quick Copy, can we have a hundred of them by, for, by Sunday? And he said, I'll have to come in on Saturday. So I said, well, I'll come and help you. And he took me up on it. So he runs them through his 
his machines and then I go in it's his workshop and fold them uh, the, the machine collates the pages fold them um, put the covers on uh, saddle stitch it on his you know electric machine and then you've got to guillotine the edge because the inner pages stick out further than the outer page and do the guillotining so I did all the, the work and then he just charged me two dollars each so I thought well I can donate the two dollars to to the Tonga appeal and sell the books for five bucks and the whole five bucks then can go to Tonga which I've been doing so we printed a hundred and obviously I gave some to relatives and friends and and uh, sold some but then um, we had to do lots of reprints and uh, the numbers up to nearly 600 at the moment and um, I found myself being invited as a guest speaker to uh, a couple of Probus clubs and a Rotary club and <laughs> and one coming up at North Bourbon Uniting Church for an end of year dinner and um, so you, you, you obviously sell a few books at there quite apart from providing some entertainment and having a thoroughly good time myself uh, so and and then people would buy one and then uh, say can I have another 10 I want them for presents oh yeah sure and there's one one 99 year old lady at our church who bought one and then she bought 10 because at the village where she lives she wanted to share them round and then some of the people that she shared them with wanted some to share them round as well and I think she's accounted for 46 of them <laughs> so uh, with people buying them for for gifts and uh, uh, with speaking at uh, to, to groups it's up to about 600 so I've, Mr Tonga's got two thousand dollars already from me with obviously more more to come so that's how <laughs> so that's how I've distributed it. um now I was interested in inquiring about publishing and uh, I made the mistake of logging into a website to get some information and that resulted in some marketing woman annoying me quite often and not taking no for an answer but was basically offering to say it uh, cost 1500 bucks or something for their costs um, and then they they would uh, print them and distribute them globally and um, sell them at whatever price they they chose would have been 15 bucks or something I can't I don't know and and give me four dollars as a as a royalty and uh, but I just didn't want to go down that track I, mean, it's, I, I just like to give a lot of people a bit of fun and that's starting to get too serious so I said nah don't want to do that but I'd like to share there's three things sort of I learned about publishing one is copyright and in some countries you have to register copyright but in Australia you don't so just by the fact that I've written the book I've got copyright and in theory nobody should be able to reproduce it or or even read from it I think without without permission well the world's got my permission <laughs> you're welcome and uh, but I'd like to know about it just for my own ego that's all if somebody's is, is using it but uh, basically I, I don't care about that but it's interesting that copyright in Australia you don't have to register one of the things you do have to do when you publish something in Victoria is lodge a copy with the State Library it's called legal deposit and I didn't know about this but somebody told me and it's not it's not for lending it's a copy for them for archiving uh, just for the, for the record and I, I so I sent one in and I got a phone call from uh, a lady who's in charge of such things and uh, she said they get thousands of stuff you know coming in but she asks her staff to draw, draw to her attention anything special so they they said they all got a laugh out of this and uh, and she rang me to say could I have 
give her permission that she could read the poems and promote the book when she's uh, promoting to other librarians the special uh, collection they're doing of memorabilia of how Melbourne uh, survived the pandemic. So of course, so you, more more than more than welcome, more than welcome uh, to do that. The uh, the other thing I I uh, I learnt is that there's a, a thing called a catalogue number, which is a international standard book number ISBN. That right? And I didn't know about that. Um, but you your book's not going to be in a library or be able to sell it in the bookshop without an ISBN number. And the there's an Australian agent that uh, provides such numbers, but they want 54 bucks to register you as an author for the first time. And then um, just to give you a $13, $13, $13 digit number is another $44. Or if you want a barcode, it's another $89. So all of that's, well, first of all, I didn't know about that <laughs> at the time. And uh, I don't feel inclined to take it up now. I don't, it just doesn't uh, suit my purpose, I don't think. So I did learn those three things in the process. So I think that covers it, how I inadvertently become a poet and an author and a publisher. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Barry. Some very uh, witty poems there, so thank you for sharing those. So we'll have uh, questions now for either Kath uh, or for Barry. So if you have a question uh, in the room. Yes, yeah, if you have a question in the room, then I'll bring the microphone out. If you have a, a question on Zoom, then uh, we'll, uh, if you can indicate. Yeah. I think um, I think George had a question. No, no, no. Oh, you're doing the mic. Great. Um, first of all, thank you for an interesting presentation. Are you talking a lot about chat to P, uh, GDP? I've been testing the same questions or requests and so on that and Bart. Um, have you tried Bart or have you tried any, any others? to compare? It might be easier to stand up here. So, um, uh, yeah, I, um, I tried Jasper um, and I have had a little bit of a play with some um, the, the bot on Skype, but I found that chat GPT is the most intuitive um, and easy to use so far. Um, yeah, so it sort of suits my purposes. So um, I haven't, I've been more sort of, I guess, um, curious about how to get the most out of it um, than, than comparing, because there's a lot around. Um, mind you, they're, they're sort of, you know, the AI assistants are really ending up on everything. So, but yeah, so, and what was the one that you've been using? Uh, I've been sort of just, just uh, using uh, Bart. Uh -huh. um, if I found if I, uh, I, I, I give short presentations and there was a 2000 word article and I've asked both for a pricing without saying how much words and um, uh, chat GDPT dropped it down to 290 words, did a pretty good job, but did 190, but the presentation is very much better, it gave dot points of the salient, it's much, much superior. Um, Fantastic. Good but to for know. a general question, what is the meaning of life? They were fairly similar, both very well done. And uh, I don't want to go into other details, but yeah. in some instances, one is substantially better than the other. 
Fantastic. Yeah, great to know. I mean, this, it's just evolving so fast. And um, yes. yeah, I'll check it out. <laughs> So anyone else in the room? Or otherwise Peter, did have... you have a question? You, you kind of put your hand up before, but you might have had it answered by now. I don't have a question at this stage. I was really looking forward to it. <laughs> Perhaps if anyone's um, on Zoom's got a question, if you could unmic and ask it. Kath, I have a question. Um, how do you find your author's voice? Yes, how do you find your author's voice? I Well, here's my, my view on it. Um, you start with who you're writing for. So I think we have a, a natural tendency to kind of adjust our voice according to who we're writing for. So if you are writing for the CEO of your organisation, if you're not the CEO, if you are writing for, you will uh, use a certain sort of voice. Whereas if you're, you, you, or if you say, if you were writing a, um, you're going to tell the Prime Minister, for example, how to scramble eggs, you might <laughs> write, you know, explain it in a certain way. But if you were to do the same information for a four-year-old, you immediately adjust the way that you present the information, you use simpler words and, and simpler speech. So I think if you're very, very clear about who you're writing for, and in my, my program, we get quite forensic and actually think of a single person to write for, then you, uh, you will adjust the way that you write quite naturally. Uh, I think that there is also a sort of, um, I was thinking about this and thinking that I have a certain sort of persona that I put on when I write. It's just to do with the, um, with the avatar or the person I have in my mind. Um, but yeah, I do keep a sort of fairly consistent voice with that person. So yeah, that's how I do it. And how many people have you helped to write books? Yeah, I've now got 53 books on my shelf, um, oh. people who've written books using my system, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for, for Barry. Can GPT write poems? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the answer. Look, I, I, I tried it uh, a few months ago and it was bloody hopeless. It, it would rhyme but had no idea of anything else. Um, I tried it again this morning and uh, it, it had improved a fair bit. Probably it's um, a primary school, upper primary school level. But it cheated. I, I, I asked it. I, I've learned that with GPT, like you said, you've got to be very specific what you're asking. So I said, write a humorous poem in four verses about not recognising friends because they are wearing, wearing masks to protect against COVID, which is what my very first poem was about, you might recall. So first of all, it had a verse of introduction, then it had four verses that it labelled verse one, two, three, and four, and then another verse as a conclusion. So it cheated and got six verses in. <laughs> and, and I won't read them all because it's too boring, but I'll just, hmm? you want them all? Okay. In a world of masks, a funny sight, friends disguised, causing sheer delight, four verses to tell this tale so grand of mask identity unplanned. Verse one, in the park, my buddy appeared, masked and cloaked, I ne'er revered. Who goes there, I call in jest, Forgot his mask, I must confess. Verse two, you still want me to keep going? At the store, a voice did speak, a friend I thought, but oh, the tweak, without their grin, it was quite the task, lost in a sea of masked up masks. Is that enough? Yours are better. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, actually, verse four is not too bad. At last we meet unmasked and free. 
With laughter we exclaim with glee, who knew our faces held such charm? Behind those masks, we're still alarmingly warm. So um, the, the important thing about, I didn't know anything about writing poetry until I started to write poetry. And what I learned was the important thing in more important than rhyme is the rhythm of the thing. It's, uh, the poem's got to be like music. It's got to be da 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 And if you've got that right, you know, you can be forgiven just about <laughs> anything else. And and Mr. Chat GPT doesn't quite get it right. He, he, he was he was nearly right, but then he'd lapsed. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I'm not out of a job. <laughs> what was your feeling when you kind of opened the box of books for the first time? How did you feel seeing a box of books that you had written? That's interesting. I don't think I felt at all emotional about it because I didn't actually open the box because I was helping print them, wasn't I? So, so I was, the, the last thing was putting them through the guillotine and then bundling them up in 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 ten so we could uh, count them. So I, I'm an engineer. I was just pleased that we were achieving what we set out to achieve. <laughs> By the way, I should mention while well, I've got the microphone, I've got some uh, some books here, and if anyone would like one. Um, Five dollars each into the, into the box and help yourself, and all the money goes to the Tonga appeal that I mentioned. And uh, if anyone online would like one, I, I think Kirsten has put the Kirsten has put my uh, phone number and uh, yeah, and, and email address in the chat. Email address in the chat, and uh, and for those who are watching. The recording afterwards, um, I think it'll be in a PC update. We'll put it in PC update, we'll get it put in, the, in yeah. the comments on YouTube as well. Anyway, for those here, just help yourself if anyone wants more than one because you've got friends. By the way, the, the, one of the A5, um, you can mail them quite easily and, and it just costs you two stamps, or well, if you put two books in, it's three stamps. So important, getting the size right. <laughs> yes, you can. I'll, I'm happy. It's normally um, twenty nine ninety five, but let's say twenty dollars a copy here tonight. So if anybody would like to, uh, well, I could uh, discount mine to four dollars ninety nine. We'll go to price war, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> cool. Be happy to. Yeah. Do we have anyone on Zoom who wants to ask a question? We haven't had any Zoom questions yet, but maybe someone out there is holding on to one. No, not a question, but uh, just to thank you very much to both of you. It was uh, very interesting presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. And anyone else in the room who has a final question? I, I um, uh, played with uh, ChatGPT a little bit in the past, and one of the things I asked it to do was tell me what was special about Shakespeare's poetry. And it gave me a, an answer which would give it 10 out of 10 in any English exam at any level. It was really, really very, very good. The only trouble is it didn't remember it for its own work. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's interesting that you should say that because if you if that that's one of the things about ChatGPT that if you continue the conversation underneath that, and you say referring to the the points that you've made about Shakespeare, oh, okay. can you draft a, a poem that okay. draws on those you know, that uses those qualities? Yeah, that's a thought. I didn't mm. think of doing that. Mm continue the chat through and then it starts to read back through its own um, its own insights to create the the poet mm. 
Thank you, George. I make sure when I'm using chat GPT that for each of the questions and responses, I take a screen dump of that page so I've got a, a record after I close down the conversation. And I find that very useful to refer back, because I find that for me, and I must be asking the questions the wrong way, I have a lot of trouble getting GPT to AI to do what I ask it to do. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to speak to you about that later on Great. to see if you can give me some hints. Thanks. Yeah, I found being very specific, you know, so saying, be funny, you know, be, be thoughtful, be short, be long, you know. Don't use passive sentences, use active sentences. Very, very specific. Um, it helps a lot, yeah. When, when you do something on GPT, if you're not perfectly happy with the answer, you can just press a button that says, have another go at it. You can. So that's, that's quite interesting. You, you get a, a regeneration, yeah. yeah and the go. other thing you can do is say, I like this bit, but I don't like that bit. Mm -hmm. So you could say, you know, I like the way you, you um, answered the question in the beginning, but I don't like, you know, so please don't use, um, it, it got very, um, it got really um, uh, obsessed with the word unleash recently. <laughs> Everything I, you know, it was like, unleash this and unleash that. And I just said to it, don't use the word unleash <laughs> in anything you write for me. And in chat GPT-4 now, you can actually customise. So you can put a customization that stands for everything that you write. So there's an, a way of customising it. Um, and they're also developing a lot of plugins now that you can use with 4. So <clears throat> you know how it, it, it works is by scraping you know, across massive amounts of data um, up until 2021. You can get it to an interrogate a PDF, which for me is quite good because if I wanted to actually, I might instruct it to I'd do all that prompting, the customising, and then say, create some, um, you know, four 250 word posts based on my book, you know, and so I upload my PDF, and then it's actually using my content to, um, I, I did ask it once to, uh, to write in the style of Kath Walters. <laughs> I said, write the following in the style of Kath Walters. And, um, and so it did, and I came back and I said to it, how do you know that was the, the style of, <laughs> of Kath Walters? And, and it came back and said, well, Kath Walters is a, you know, a, a journalist who's been around for 25 years and clearly had somehow found my, um, and you know, has quite a conversational style. And I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I've asked it virtually the same question, and it says, we will not answer that. We do not condone writing in the style of somebody else and pretending to be that person. Wow. Yeah. Which is interesting because um, I asked it to write a hymn about some, something, I can't remember what subject, to the tune of the Dam Busters March, Dam, Dam Busters March. And there we do sing in church. Uh, hymns to that to that tune, but it said no, no, no. That's military. Won't do that. <laughs> yes, it's getting more. It's getting more ethical in certain directions. It's ethical, yeah. The, the other thing it does, if you ask it for an opinion about something, it uh, it won't give you an opinion. I can't think of a specific example, but it says no, I won't do that. But it will give you um, all of the sort of pros and cons in great detail and then summarise it. So it sort of depends on what you really want, which way yeah. you want, which is quite, quite intelligent, really. I've got a question. You, you're using uh, GPT-4. Yep. Does GPT-4 have the inevitable last paragraph that starts? It should be noted yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, I find one of the most, you're absolutely right, I think one of the most um, identifiable characteristics of robot written content 
is this kind of qualifying oh, yeah. kind of um, summary at the end that's very, really weak, I think, you know, because actually I think that conclusions to writing are some of the most important content in any piece of writing because most people go there just to see if they can get away with not reading the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's sort of like these public uh, relations releases. Anything that contains the word priority, <laughs> uh, I just dismiss straight away. It yeah. is our priority. Our customers are our priority. Oh, just that know is it's, yeah, yeah. Um, Question from chat. Um, uh, Peter Carpenter asks, I didn't hear what is... Um, what it is that Kath is discounting tonight, a book on writing? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so my book, um, Overnight Authority, How to Win Respect, Command Attention and Earn More Money by Writing a Book in 90 Days. So that is everything I know about writing a book. You do not have to pay me anything more than $20 to find out everything in my brain. You can and buy post it. <laughs> You can buy four of my books for yeah, that. Exactly. <laughs> Talk about a bargain. <laughs> well, I'm definitely buying one. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Kath. Can, the, um, can you put details up in the chat box for us about your book? Yeah. Can someone put no details problems. in the chat yeah. box? All right. Well, uh, yeah, I think we, uh, we better leave it there. So um, thank you very much to both of you, to Kath and to Barry. Um, very interesting um, talks and um, and discussion afterwards. Um, you know, chat GPT is fascinating, and it's always great to hear about that and how it can be used for publishing. And Barry's phone is very entertaining, so thank you very much. And the process of becoming an author. Um, as a as a visitor to the club, cats, we'd uh, like to thank you very much for your time tonight, and we'd like to present you with a bottle of uh, Barassa Red, so hope you enjoy that and think of us as you drink it, so always. And uh, now I will give my very brief President's report. This is all in PC Update this month, by the way, so um, I'm going to go through this quickly to save a bit of time. Um, so you can read the full text in PC Update. So the, uh, the first thing that I want to just uh, mention is the Bunnings barbecue. So we're going to be holding a Bunnings barbecue to raise some extra money for the club and to promote the club to the wider community. So um, that's going to be on August 13, over the road at Moravon Bunnings from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. I said 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the PC update, but uh, we're setting up at 8 a.m. So don't come till 9 a.m. if you're going to come early. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the, uh, the club CNC project. So we're proposing to build a, a CNC router. So if you've ever wanted to be a part of uh, building a, a CNC router, which is a, a big cutting machine that's controlled by computers to, to make various different things, um, we're going to be getting started on that. So there'll be an email going out soon um, with expressions of interest to, to join us in that uh, project. Uh, the next thing is the uh, the Melbourne Society of Model and Experimental Engineers exhibition. So um, they're holding the exhibition on September 16 this year at South Oakley College in Oakley South, and it's uh, their Let's Make It exhibition. So our Melbourne PC user group uh, will be there. We'll have a stand. So um, for all the makers in the club, it's your chance to to show off what you've been working on of late. Um, and so please get in touch with me if you have something to show. Um, and for anyone else who's just interested in what the club's doing, uh, please come along and, and have a look at uh, what, what we've got on display. Uh, grand final day. So this year, uh, we're going to um, celebrate grand final day here at Melbourne PC user group. So uh, for the day, we'll have uh, the, the game uh, on the big screen here. So uh, if you um, don't have someone to, if you are interested in the footy, and uh, you don't have somewhere to go to, to watch the footy, then uh, we'll have it on here at Melbourne PC User Group. So um, there'll be an email coming out about that closer to the day as well. So uh, keep that in mind if that sounds appealing. And um, then the final thing is um, a club open day. So uh, it's been about five years since we've had a club open day. Um, we've had a few 
few things get in the way in that five year period, but um, we thought it was time to have another one. So uh, November this year, uh, we're gonna have one. Um, there's no fixed date yet. So we still gotta work out which weekend we're gonna have it, but uh, we'll be finalizing that soon and getting details out in an email as well. So once again, um, for every club member, if you have something to show, um, you know, something you've made or something really sick that you've done, a video, a piece of photography, uh, whatever, um, you can get in touch with us and uh, when the time comes and uh, come along and exhibit it. And uh, the plan will be as well to invite some other groups in uh, from the community to uh, to show off what they've been doing as well. So we get a, you know, create connections and uh, we get a, you know, everyone can see what's been going on in the community. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, that's basically the the president's report for this month. So, um, any any questions or comments on that from anyone? Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, so now um, it is time for Stuart Granickley with I Help Lives. So hopefully you're out there somewhere, Stuart, in Queensland, I believe. Ready for I, am in, I am indeed. Um, let me just adjust this view. I've only got one very small screen to look at. Um, I help. Okay. So to do something just a little bit different, I've put together a, a presentation. I'll try not to bore you with too many hundred slides, but I thought it's something that's uh, important to go through at least once every 10 years or so. So I'll uh, just see if I can share the screen. Uh, so you should see something there that, that looks a little bit uh, help for you. Can I have some uh, recognition from anybody? Yep, that's anybody? good, Stuart. That's good. Okay, so you're seeing, okay. So the agenda, basically, three steps. Uh, any more than three gets confusing. So three steps, how to contact I help, and a little bit about Be Connected, which is not I help, but it's very related, as you'll see. And then there's uh, some opportunities. Now I've got to work out how to forward these um, slides. Ah, that'll do. Good. Um, so I help. So what is I help? Well, it's a technology help service. It used to be computer service. And it was basically on the internet when we had dial-up. But it's a lot broader than that nowadays. It's basically anything that goes wrong with your computers or peripherals or um, iPhones, iPads, uh, tablets, Android phones, whatever. Uh, you can contact iHelp and you'll find somebody within the iHelp team that has a bit of expertise or they're very good at Googling. So um, that's what iHelp is. It's a technology help service for members. So how do you call for help? Okay, there's three ways. Again, I'll stick with this line of three things. You can telephone us, or you can email us, or you can use a website online form. So, okay, telephone, you can call 9276 4088 and leave a message. Now, you used to be able to get straight through to the person that was on duty, but uh, due to a change, mainly a cost cutting, cost cost cutting measure, we uh, we stopped doing that, and now all you can do is leave a message. So hopefully you'll leave your name, your phone number that you want to be called on, and maybe a brief description of the the problem that you're experiencing, uh, and of course your membership number. But usually, I shouldn't say this, but usually your name is enough because we can look up the, the, the name list and we can identify people. Even sometimes we just identify people from their phone numbers when it 
coming through. But if you leave your membership number, your name, the, the problem, and a phone number, we'll call you back. And generally, we work Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. However, if uh, you have problems out of those hours, you might just get lucky and pick up somebody um, that's in the iHelp team that's watching what's going on and looking at their emails, and they'll get back in touch with you. So what are the other ways? Well, email. You can always email iHelp at melpc.org.au. And again, uh, we'll call you back or we might email back to you. And sometimes that works over the weekends too, but don't I, I don't promise that. The third way is particularly if you've lost contact with your emails and that is your problem, or your phone is down, but you've got access to somebody's computer and a browser. So you can open up the browser, go to the Melbourne PC website, which is there. It's www.melpc.org.au. And you can then click on the I help once you're into the, um, um, the website. Click on the I help, which is usually in the menu bar across the top. If it's not, uh, particularly if you've got a phone that you're looking at, which is a very restricted screen, you might see the little hamburger or the, the three horizontal bars. You click on those and you'll get access to all of those menu items. So you click on I help. And then when you get to that page, you scroll down a bit and open support request and click there. That will then give you a support request form which you can then fill out and click on submit down the bottom. And that will come through as an email to all the iHelp team as does everything else. So all those three contact methods will result in an email, text or voice message being sent to members of the iHelp team. The team numbers probably oh, a dozen or so currently. Um, not all of those are rostered on during the week, but uh, nevertheless, they're available to call on for uh, particular problems. And when we call you back for your safety, please ensure that you're actually talking to uh, an iHelp team member. So you might want to ask them some questions and usually it's it's our um, our practice to actually establish our bona fides simply by telling you that you've called, telling you some of the details that only you would know, particularly about the problem that you've got. So hopefully that's... Um, enough of a guideline but if you're unsure then please ask questions we won't be embarrassed to um, establish that we are really who we say we are remember that the the criminals are out there they're always trying to impersonate legitimate callers and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference so please be aware that if somebody claiming to be from my help calls you just sort of ensure that you are happy that that is in fact the case. We, we don't want anybody to be caught up uh, by scammers. I'll tell you a little bit about Be Connected. We started it in April 2022, um, and we helped club members and members of the public with their various digital devices and it was all conducted at the Moorabbin Club Rooms. And to do that job, particularly because we said it's for members of the public, and of course all our club members are also members of the public, the club received a federal government grant of $2,500 to conduct these courses for a year. 
that year, of course, has expired, and we've decided to continue to conduct these uh, services for members of the public and club members, and it's continuing. And it, but it's not every Wednesday as we had it before. It's every second and fourth Wednesday each month, and that's sometimes a little bit hard to remember. Um, but if you check our website, you can see that it is stated there. It's second and fourth Wednesday each month. So it's our Moravan Club Rooms and Jeff Amor, Steph Lancaster and John Sims are uh, doing the service for our members and members of the public. So I, I think we should thank them for... Um, continuing on with this service. Uh, the reason I'm not doing any more is because at the moment I'm in Queensland. It's a bit hard to get to Moravan um, so quickly. Oops. Okay. Right. You can receive help with your di digital devices from the Be Connected team at Moorabbin, but you can also access a very good resource um, at the https colon forward slash forward slash beconnected.esafety.gov.au. What you get there is a whole host of courses, uh, ways of learning things and this was particularly important for the Be Connected team for a start because a lot of people kept coming in with iPhones and iPads and, you know, at the start, we didn't know much about those sort of things, being Apple. Um, originally, Melbourne PC user group was sort of the, the Microsoft thing, but it's a lot broader than that now. So... We had to do a bit of learning ourselves to, to get up to date with the Apple products. And there's a, a pretty good covering of Windows, Apple, um, Android uh, on this Be Connected website, which is a government site. And there are literally hundreds of lessons on different devices, uh, including on how to get into MyGov and all sorts of things like that. Uh, so I thoroughly recommend have a look at the uh, the Be Connected site and just um, look at the, the the wide range of interesting stuff that is there. Some of it's very basic. Uh, some of it is less than basic. It's it's quite complex. Um, try the MyGov, for instance, and it would be uh, a very good thing to look at. Sorry. Let's go back there a step. Okay. Opportunities. Do you have spare time? Do you, are you a, a patient person? And do you have some technical know-how? If that's the case, then you can join the iHelp team. You can join the Be Connected team. Neither of those things mean you have to be on call all the time or anything like that. Uh, we can, we can uh, fit you in to suit your needs. If you're near, New Ma near Moravan, then the Be Connected team might be a, a good fit. If you're anywhere on planet Earth, the iHelp team can do it for you because the, uh, the iHelp team have a dedicated telephone, which is a 3CX system, which is part of the, the, the club system. And you make use of that for the iHelp communications. It's a very simple and, and very useful system to use uh, and as you can see you know we've got somebody dialing in from where was it it's in the chat 
uh, somewhere overseas, Dubai, I think it was. And uh, I'm up in Tunnamulla in Queensland at the moment, enjoying the warmth up here. Uh, so why would you volunteer for either of these teams? Well, you can get enormous satisfaction out of helping people. You can learn a lot of new skills and things you never ever dreamt that you needed. Uh, you can give back to the club what you've gained from it over the years. You can minimise your own boredom and you can keep those brain cells active and ward off dementia. So they're just a few of the uh, benefits of volunteering for iHelp or the Be Connected teams. Oh, sorry, just go back one. Previous. Okay, contact emails. If you want to be any part of the Be Connected team, we've certainly got vacancies for a few other helpers there. Uh, contact Jeff Amor. And the email address is beconnected, all one word, at melpc.org.au. Uh, or if you're interested in the iHelp, then Dave Simpson is the coordinator there for at iHelp at melpc.org.au. Does anybody have questions? Just, uh, you could put your hand up. I might just uh, get out of this sharing. That's better. Uh, Cedric, you have a question. Um, could I just add to that one, please, Stuart? Certainly. Um, I, I'm always looking for extras on the... Uh, home visit team, 99% um, of the jobs that come in to us, this is for the members, you probably know, are uh, handled over the phone. But we have occasional jobs that involve a home visit, which is a much more time intensive, you're traveling and so forth. You usually find that it's a much bigger job than you expected when you get there. Um, particularly, I'm always looking for people outside what we call the center of gravity of our membership. Around about the Waverleys and so forth, I've got enough volunteers. But if there's somebody can put their hand up to take jobs in Werribee or in Warburton or in um, up the top end of uh, St Andrews or anywhere like that, I certainly would like to hear from them. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Cedric, because that, that is an important part of iHelp. As Cedric said, it's, it's um, rare that we need to do that, but when we do, we have members that really need help at home, in person, and we try to provide that where we can. So we're always looking for volunteers for, for that sort of uh, um, position. Um, John Thompson. Hi, Stuart. Um, you might not have caught up with the meeting chat, but somebody's been asking about um, using quick assess, assist would you like to explain briefly how Quick Assist works? Uh, the, the original suggestion was to use Zoom, but um, somebody who's working the Moravian Zoom um, laptop has suggested Quick Assist. Yeah, look, Quick Assist uh, used to be part of Windows 10, and it was very simple to use. Uh, Microsoft, in their wisdom, decided that they would beef up the security, which is probably always a good idea. 
but the way they went about it was rather, I think, clumsy. Uh, they stopped providing it as part of Windows 10, and they supplied it then through their app store as an independent uh, application. And along the way, they went and changed the interface of it, and there have been two or three different changes over the last few months. And now whoever uses it, that's that's trying to help has to actually log into a Microsoft account and they have to jump through a few other hoops to actually get it working. Uh, okay, so what it is, uh, Joe Gold has asked, you know, what is Quick Assist? Well, Quick Assist is a means of sharing um, the view of somebody's computer to somebody else who is remote from that computer. It's sharing the same computer. It used to be able it used to be able to control as well as view a computer. But some of that control's been taken away as well. So it's it's not my um, quick assist is not my choice anymore. Beam viewer is something that we've been using for many years. And that seems to be still working pretty much the way it always has and is is quite a good um, thing to use. But remember that scammers will also love to use those sorts of um, uh, applications to try to uh, take over control of your computer. There are, there are safeguards built in. But the, um, the biggest danger is the person in front of the computer, always. If, uh, if they've been tricked into allowing somebody to share their computer, then there's nothing going to stop them. I hope Joey, that's answered the question. Yeah, Joey um, suggested the use of Zoom. Um, I just wanted to chip in there that Zoom has a facility or remote control. You can not only share a screen, but you can remote control the other person's um, computer. And yes. I've used that several times for helping people. Um, it does that is, have the added yeah. advantage that you can talk to the person beforehand and settle your security problems if you've got any doubts. And yes. Just hand over and uh, you can fix problems that way. Yes, soon certainly you can do that. And we're all, uh, anybody that has a melpc.org.au um, Google Workspace account can also use the, the Google Meet or mm -hmm. whatever they're calling it this week. Um, they can also <laughs> use that the Google facility to do all of those things, including whiteboards and whatever else. Can you do uh, remote control with Meet? I believe you can, but uh, normally I would just simply use TeamViewer, and I'm, yeah. I'm not familiar yeah. with either the Zoom or the um, uh, the Google Meet uh, facilities. But there, there are many different ways of controlling. We've, we've got a number of different methods that are available to iHelp. Uh, I can't recall them just off the top of my called, head. There's another one called AnyDesk. Uh, that's right. There's AnyDesk. There's uh, go, to, go to something or other. There's a whole range of go-tos. Um, Uh, yeah, anyway, there there are many different facilities that can be used. Um, the, the team, the iHelp team, tend to uh, get a bit of experience on one or two different things. And you know, while I'll, I'll prefer to use TeamViewer, there might be others that um, prefer Quick Assist or prefer Zoom or prefer whatever else. 
it's a matter of explaining it to the the person seeking help and downloading and installing whichever um, facility is is desired. And they all ask the recipient of the help for permission to share their screen, share control of it too. So you've got that added security yes. hurdle. Yeah, normally we'd be talking over the phone and explaining things as we go along. And there would need to be an exchange of passwords or IDs or whatever else to uh, to make sure it's it's secure. But of course, that doesn't um, that doesn't exclude scammers who might be pretending to be um, somebody who is helpful. All right. Well, we might uh, leave it there and wind up the formal meeting. So, thank you, Stuart. And uh, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you can stay online with Stuart after we round up the formal meeting. Um, so hold on to your questions if you have them on Zoom. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, Stuart and, uh, and Kath and Barry once again for tonight and for their contributions. I'd like to thank everyone for coming along and for everyone on Zoom for, for joining us. Uh, don't forget the waffle sig is on. So um, if you feel like some dinner afterwards, uh, Fong's restaurant in Bentley. She was be going down there, so uh, do come along. And uh, our next meeting will be on the 6th of September at 7pm. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all then, whether it's uh, here at Rabin or whether it's online on Zoom. So uh, until then, take care of yourselves and uh, we'll, we'll see you then. <laughs>